Good morning, folks. It's time for us to begin. I've got a few folks here in the audience, and uh, I hope a lot more watching online. This morning, we want to continue to look at the book of Acts as we look at how the first century church fulfilled the Great Commission in making disciples uh, for Christ. I want to remind you that we are in the Bible app, and if you have difficulty with that, someone caught me last week and said, what are you talking about? And so I got that for them, got them found online, and they uh, got the questions that go along with the class. And I've got some questions on there today uh, to uh, help you further your study. If you need some help with that, I'll be glad uh, to coach you through that. It's not really that difficult uh, to find and use, but uh, I guess it just takes a few minutes to sit down and look at it. But I encourage you to do that. This morning we want to look at Acts chapter 16, 17, and 18. I know that's ambitious, but we're supposed to finish the book of Acts by the end of uh, June. I want to warn you right now, we won't, uh, but we'll get the bulk of it, and, uh, and we'll go from there. That's all right, though. We've got some other stuff. Maybe we can uh, finish it up when we get into uh, July. We'll see how that goes. But today we want to look at the second missionary journey. And beginning in Acts chapter 15, back up a couple of verses, we talked about this last week, that Paul said to Barnabas, let's do it again. Let's go back and, and visit the, ch- the cities, the churches uh, that we'd established and if you go back to the end of chapter 14, they had gone back through the cities and established or appointed elders in every church. And it's been a year or two. Paul says, let's go check them out. Barnabas says, let's take John Mark. And Paul says, no way. And so Barnabas, after some disagreement, Barnabas takes John Mark and he leaves the narrative of the book of Acts. The book of Acts is, is kind of misnamed. It's not the Acts of the Apostles. It's the actions of Peter and of Paul, and the rest of them are just neglected in the discussion. And one of the things that we sometimes do is we fail to realize that there's a whole lot going on <clears throat> outside of the story that we're given. <clears throat> we start, l- learned earlier that Peter went all over uh, Palestine, went to Samaria, went to Joppa, went to Caesarea. Later he goes to Antioch. Is he the only apostle that traveled? What about Matthew? What did he do? What about Bartholomew? What did he do? What about uh, Andrew? What about these others? Did they just sit at home doing nothing, twiddling their thumbs? <clears throat> the fact that we mention and concentrate on one doesn't mean the others did nothing. And we'll see this as we go through that Paul runs into some things that he hadn't done. He hadn't established a church there. And that'll come up uh, perhaps as we go through. But so uh, Barnabas takes John Mark and they go back down to the island of Cyprus, which was Barnabas' home country. He was from Cyprus. And perhaps he went on up to Perga uh, in Pamphylia and visited the church the area there. But meanwhile, Paul takes Silas, and he goes from Antioch up through Syria and Cilicia. Remember, Cilicia is Paul's home country. He goes back to Tarsus, where he was raised, where he had been for Seven years before Barnabas came and got him uh, to come back to Antioch, and then they went on the first journey. Uh, so he'd been there for a while. The church had been established there. So he goes back through there, then they go back to Derby and to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and so on. But when they get to Lystra, chapter 16, <clears throat> verse 1, <clears throat> excuse me. Paul came to Derby and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy the son of a father, or excuse me, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was part Jew and part Gentile. Well spoken of by the brethren who enlisted in Iconium, Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew his father was a Greek. And as they were passing through the cities, here we go. So, One thing we've got to realize on this second missionary journey, Paul and those traveling with him are guided by the Spirit. And I think this kind of frustrated Paul at a time or two until he realized that God had something ahead of him waiting for him that he didn't know about. There was a heart prepared that Paul didn't know about. There was a city that needed to hear the gospel that Paul did not have on his itinerary. But the Spirit was guiding them and leading them through. So Paul takes Silas, and I've got a question mark by Titus. Did Titus go with him? Very possibly so. 
Very possibly so. He's not mentioned at all. But there's some indications in some of Paul's letters that indicate Titus was on this trip. Definitely he was on the third trip uh, that we'll study in a week or so, but he was, you know, he was on the second trip maybe. So I got a question mark by that, so kind of bear with that as we go. But he stops at Lystra and says, I want Timothy to go. Now here's the issue. If you read down to verse 4, as they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees that had been decided upon by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem, the decrees we looked at last week in chapter 15 that said the Gentiles did not have to be circumcised and keep the law. Titus, Paul will later explain, was not circumcised. Why have Timothy? We each have different talents, abilities, and inroads, if I can use that term. We know people that know people. And we can get ourselves into this area or this position because of who we know and who we are. It's influence, I guess. Timothy was part Jew. He could work in the synagogues because he was part Jew, whereas Titus could not. Now, when you go to the synagogue, you've got the amen corner. Some of us know what that is. Up here in the front, you've got the rabbis, the the leaders, the deacons, those people who are very important in the synagogue, the ones who are checking roll, knocking heads, those guys. They're sitting up front. The men sit up front. The women and children sit back yonder. And the Gentiles sit in the way back. So Titus would have to sit way back there and maybe even outside since he was not a proselyte. But Timothy, being part Jew, could actually come up here and sit and actually speak. You remember when Paul and Barnabas got to Antioch and Pisidia? They went in and sat down in the synagogue and they went and said, would you like to say something? Now, asking Paul if he wants to preach is like saying, sick him to a bulldog. Yeah, he wanted to preach. And he got up and he preached Jesus to them on that occasion. Timothy could do that. Titus could not. But Timothy had to be circumcised first to have that access. Now, how they figured all that, I don't know, but that's what's going on. So, verse 6, they passed through Phrygia and Galatia, this whole neck of the country, and Paul wanted to go up to uh, Bithynia. The Spirit said, nope. He wanted to go to Asia, down here toward Ephesus. And the Spirit said, nope. And he wound up in Mycia at Troas. Now, when you compare Troas, it it was a major seaport on the north side of the the Aegean Sea there. But when you compare Troas with Ephesus, it's like going from Montgomery to slap out. If you bend over and tie your shoes while you're driving through, you'll miss the whole show. Troas was a jumping off place, but it was not a big place. It was not a bustling city. It was not where Paul wanted to be. And I'm sure when he went to bed that night, him thinking, he's thinking, you know, Lord, I, there's so many people up here and so many people down here. Why can't we go there? But there was a lady going to Riverside to pray that needed to hear the gospel. The Spirit knew that. Paul did not. And so that night, verse 9, Paul had a vision. A man of Macedonia standing and appealing to him saying, come to Macedonia and help us. The next morning at breakfast, Paul sat in there with Silas and Timothy, maybe Titus, maybe some others traveled with him. Silas said, how did you sleep last night? Not good. What's your itinerary for today? We're taking the boat to Philippi. Timothy pulls out his itinerary and said, wait a minute, that's not on the list. Paul said, oh, yeah, it is. I had a vision. I saw a man from Macedonia come and help us, and we're going. Immediately, look at verse 10. When he had seen the vision, immediately we saw it. Now, if you're reading very carefully, you will notice, you start back up to getting to chapter 16, Paul said, let's go. They went, they went, they went, they went, they did, they did. Verse 10, we. The pronoun changes. Luke, the author of Acts, joins Paul's party at Troas 
and begins to travel with him. Now, kind of watch it. When he gets to Philippi, it goes back to they. And Luke stays in Philippi. But Luke points out, verse 11, putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, the day following to Neapolis, from there to Philippi. Now, looking at the map, that's not that big a jump. But when they come back, it takes seven days to make that trip. Sir William Ramsey was in college at Cambridge in England. He did not believe in the Bible. He wasn't an atheist. He just did not believe in the accuracy and inspiration of the Scripture. So he made it his life's work to disprove the Scripture, beginning with the book of Acts. And so he went to Asia Minor, and he began to study the places and make the trips. And he found out that the book of Acts is completely accurate. But this trip from Troas to Philippi bothered him. And then he discovered that there are certain times of the year the current and the wind shifts. And you can make that trip in two days. He was astounded at the accuracy of the scripture. And rather than trying to disprove the book of Acts, he sought out to prove the works of Paul. And his writings, they're a little clumsy to read for our English, but they're very good because he researches the cities and the work that Paul did and gives a lot of insight into Paul and his life. But as they return through these cities, he picks up Timothy and then he gets to Macedonia and the vision we change to the pronoun we. All right, so we get to Philippi. Uh, yeah, one page. Philippi was a Roman city. It was not a Jewish city. It was a Roman colony. It was granted Roman citizenship and that freedom that goes with it. And it was a principal city of Macedonia. It was founded by Philip, the father of Alexander the Great. And it was a very important city because of the crossroads and the commerce that came through there. And from there, headed on towards, towards Rome. But Philippi was not a Jewish city. There was no synagogue there. But there were people there who needed to hear the gospel. And so when Paul gets to Philippi, and incidentally, Thessalonica, our next stop, is also a principal city of Macedonia. But Macedonia is divided into some districts. And Philippi is in the northern district and Thessalonica in the next district down. And so they're kind of like county seats, maybe a little bigger than that. Capitals, uh, maybe like that, uh, give you an idea of the importance of these cities. But when you get to Philippi, verse uh, 13, On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to, an over, to the riverside. Outside the gate. And we're supposing there would have been a place of prayer. We sat down, began speaking to the women who had assembled. Because there was no synagogue, and remind us, in order for there to be an established synagogue, somehow we've been taught there had to be ten men. There had to be ten men of age, of wisdom, of position, and of possession, wealth, to build and oversee, construct, and, and see about a synagogue. It wasn't that he went out and just built a little building. There had to be some rules that had to be followed in order to establish a synagogue. But in the absence of those, the Jews would go out of the city because in the city, it was a Roman city, it was an idolatrous city, they would go out of the city and build a small shed, not a synagogue, a small house, a little area where they could assemble and pray. And they'd want it by the river because of the washings that were required by the law of Moses. And so they figured there's a place out there. They found it and began visiting, talking to the women who had assembled because apparently none of the men had come. Perhaps there were not that many Jewish men in Philippi. And verse 14, there's a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. Thyatira's over here. Uh, 
it was well known for the production and the exporting of the color purple, the, uh, purple dye that was needed and required by royalty and others of position. And she was a traveling saleswoman. And she heard the gospel, and the Lord opened her heart to the things, and she responded to things spoken by Paul. She and her household were baptized. And she said, y'all stay with me. She opened up her heart to the Lord and opened up her house to the missionaries. God wanted Paul not to go to Mycenae or to Asia, but to Philippi, because there was a woman at the riverside who needed the gospel. Paul wanted Paul, or God wanted Paul to go to Philippi because there was a soul that needed to hear. Paul did not see that until much later. And I ask sometimes if we look back in our lives, where was God leading us and we didn't know it? Why is it that we are here instead of there? Why was that door closed? Why was that opportunity taken away and another one given in its place? It was the Spirit leading. And we asked God to guide us. And you remember this one? Guard, guide, and direct us. We used to pray that all the time. We ask for that, and when we get it, we don't keep realize it. And then later we look back, and did we really give God the credit for doing that? That he was in charge. He was guiding. He was leading. He was protecting. But he was leading us in a place that he wanted us to be. I hope looking back at, at our lives, we can see there were some crucial moments, maybe some embarrassing moments, that made us realize that, you know, God's got a purpose for me. I need to figure out what it is. So Paul baptized Lydia and her household. As they were moving around the city day by day, there was a servant girl possessed by a demon, and her owners, she was a slave, her owners were having her tell fortunes with that demon she had. And they were making money off of her. But she came up behind Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy, and she began to scream, These men are bondservants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. How did she know that? She did not. The demon in her did. Now, the demons are basically angels of Satan. They knew who Jesus was. They knew who Paul was. They knew who Paul was preaching. And she was proclaiming that you folks need to listen to him because this. And Paul got tired of it. He turned around and threw the demon out of her. Why? I mean, we need that advertisement. That's better than a billboard. When we go to court for whatever reason we might go to court, you watch law and order and all that kind of stuff, we're going to have a witness. And one of the first things they ask about the witness is their character. Okay, this guy that's going to bear a witness is an ex-con, he's a robber, he's a thief, he's, we, we really wonder, should we have him testify? Is his word really reliable? Can we? Because we're judging the character of the witness, and that influences the integrity of the testimony. And so Paul does not want this demon's testimony. He can do without it. And so that causes that. But then her masters, realizing their source of income has been destroyed, they grab Paul and Silas, they take him to the authorities, they have him beaten and thrown in jail. And they did not have a trial. Now, a Roman colony, not a Jewish colony, a Roman colony governed by the Romans, answerable to understanding the Roman law, violated the Roman law because Paul and Silas were both Roman citizens. 
and the rules of citizenship required that a Roman citizen cannot be arrested, tried, beaten, and jailed in the same day. We have some of that in our legal system because it's based on that Roman concept. They did it all in one day. Next day they say, all right, y'all go. And Paul says, mm-mm, we ain't going. He's basically saying, you guys going to come down here and you're going to ask us to leave nicely because we are Roman citizens and we're not supposed to be beaten like you beat us. And they are beginning to eat humble pie because they know all Paul has got to do is make one quick phone call to Rome and the whole place is in trouble. They knew that. All Paul had to do was report it. And they were in so much trouble they'd never get out of it. But Paul didn't do that. He just wanted them to respect the fact that they had done wrong. Now in the meantime... Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening. Now, I heard one guy said, if it had been me and Paul down there, he'd have been praying and singing. I'd been moaning and groaning. You look at this. This was not a Jewish beating. The Jews had a law, and it's in the law of Moses. When you have to beat a man, he gets 40 licks. Now, if you give him four to one, he gives that four to one, the forty-first one back. So they would stop at thirty-nine, in case somebody miscounted. You know, it's be on the safe side. Romans didn't have that rule. They beat a guy until he was a pulp. They didn't care. So when they found his Roman citizen, they had trouble. So at midnight, Paul and Silas are praying and singing, and the prisoners are listening. I mean, there's a guy over here in chains tapping his foot. You know, that's a good song. By the way, if you look in the song books there, the song Shepherd of Tender Youth is the oldest Christian hymn that we've ever found. And it dates back to about the second or third century. So I don't know if they were singing that one, but they were singing. And the prisoners were listening. What they were singing, probably something from the book of Psalms, because that was their psalm book that they would know. And at midnight, God sent an earthquake. God got involved. The jailer comes in, sees the prison door open. His first thought, everybody's escaped. He draws his sword, and he's going to kill himself. Because the Roman law is, if you let a prisoner escape, you have to suffer his punishment. If he's going to have to pay a fine, you got to pay the fine. If he's in jail for 30 days, you have to be in jail for 30 days. If he's going to be executed, you're going to be executed for every one of the prisoners. So it's easy to go ahead and kill yourself and get over it. I mean, just be done with it. No. Paul said, wait a minute, don't do that. We're all here. Nobody has left. Why did nobody leave? What, what did Paul say to say, y'all just be still. God's in charge. I mean, the place is shaking. I'd like to get out just because the building's shaking. No, they're all sitting there. And the jailer comes in and takes Paul and Silas. Now, I wonder, was the jailer upstairs listening to the songs? He brings them out and said, fellas, what do I need to do? And Paul says, verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord. Because here's the next question the jailer is not written. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Who is he? So they began to speak the word of the Lord together with him and everybody in his household. Maybe everybody in the whole prison. He took them that hour of the night, washed their wounds. And I'm thinking while he's washing wounds, they're preaching. And then he was baptized. Why was he baptized? Because somewhere in the preaching of Jesus Christ, baptism has to be brought into the, into the message. And watch this, verse 34. He brought them into his household, set food before them, rejoiced greatly, having believed in God. What do I need to do? Believe. Okay, that's not just the, okay, I believe Jesus is Christ. It's not just the comment of saying, I understand, I agree. 
It's an action involved. And and the the having believed here in the original implies that he did something other than just, okay, I believe. He was baptized. That's part of having believed. Then the magistrates say, okay, y'all can leave, and they have problems. So they leave, and they go down to, uh, from Philippi, they go through Amphipolis and Apollonia, down to Thessalonica, another major city. And here they go into the synagogues, and they begin to preach. Verse 3, explaining that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is the very Christ. Now, Paul's working here from the Scriptures. He's working in the synagogue. He worked from the Scriptures with Lydia. He's worked from the Scriptures all these other places he's gone to, opening the Scriptures and showing that Jesus is the Christ. Some were persuaded. They joined Paul. And many of the Greeks, God-fearing, joined him as well. Leading women joined him as well. In other words, they were hearing and obeying the gospel. They were following along. But the Jews got jealous. And they start causing trouble. Verse 6, they take Jason. That's who he's staying with. They can't find Paul and Silas. They grab Jason, take him for the town magistrates and say, these men who have upset the world have come here too. Now, the King James, we, we can quote, They've turned the world upside down. These guys who upset the whole world have made it here, and we don't want them here. Why? Because we're jealous. Because we don't like what they're doing. So they run them out of town. But Paul and Silas go to Berea. What about Timothy? It's evident right here that Timothy stays behind in Thessalonica and continues to work with the church. And when they get to Berea, they begin going to synagogues and teaching again. And verse 11 says, Now the people in Berea were more noble than the people in Thessalonica because they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily, to see whether these things were so. They didn't take Paul and Silas's word for it. They went back and pulled out their copies of the scriptures in the synagogue, and they began to read it straight for themselves and say, you know what? He's right. What he's saying is what the prophets are saying. He's not twisting the scriptures. They were searching the scriptures. I told a group of kids one time, I said, I dare you. I dare you to catch me making a mistake. And I did it on purpose. I want to be sure I was right. About three months later, I was quoting a verse, and one of the boys came unglued. I caught you. What? You missed a comma. His mother said he had started studying so much trying to find me in error. Said she couldn't believe how much he was working. He was going to find me making a mistake. I guess he's still studying. He changed his life. They changed their lives by searching the scriptures to prove that this is what the book does say. I issue the same challenge to each of us to do the same. Well, the folks from, Je- from Thessalonica heard what was going down in Berea. So they go down to Berea and raise a ruckus, and they run Paul out. So the brethren take Paul by sea down to the coastline, put him on a boat, send him down to Athens by himself. And when he gets to Athens, he tells the guys that, that ran him down there, said, go back and tell Silas, catch up, or Timothy and Silas, catch up with me. He left them at Thessalonica and Berea to continue to work for the church. So this traveling party is split up, and Paul's by himself in Athens. Now, verse 16, while Paul was in Athens, his spirit was provoked with them because he was observing the city full of idols. Athens was about a mile from the seacoast, and the the port town was Piraeus. And all the merchants bringing their wares into Athens from the seaport had trouble, and so they built a wall on either side of the road to protect them from being attacked by robbers and such making that trip with wagons and carts and oxen full of, of wares to sell. Every 
10 feet on either side of the wall, on either side of the road, every 10 feet, there was an idol or an altar. Now, to give you an idea, we've gone through this social distancing of keeping six feet apart. That far apart was an idol, an altar. And that's just on the road leading into town. Take your community, your neighborhood where you live. I don't care how big it is. Take out all the yards. Put all the houses side by each so you and your neighbor share the same gutter and downspout. Okay? Take out all the sidewalks and roads so all you got is just basically the width of a sidewalk between your house and the guys across the street. Keep all the fire hydrants, mailboxes, telephone poles, signposts, yard signs, garden sheds, because all those posts and things sticking up out of the ground would represent the altar. And all those garden sheds and carports and garages, take them off, separate them, they would represent in our little community a temple. That's Athens. Everywhere you looked, there was an altar or an idol or a temple. And then and, and, and there was one hill, there's three major hills for Athens. The Penix, they call it, was where they met to discuss community events. Okay, so, so if they were electing a new mayor, they'd meet up there and hear all the political speeches. There was the Acropolis. Every, one of these, almost every one of these cities had an Acropolis. On the Acropolis was the temple or temples to the major gods that they worshipped. The Acropolis was covered with temples. You go to Centennial Park in Nashville and look at the Parthenon model there. It's an exact replica of that that was there when Paul was in Athens, Greece. Beautiful, magnificent temple. That's only one. As you go up the entrance into the Acropolis, there was a temple to Nike, the messenger god, without wings. Because there's another temple to Nike with wings. They wanted one with him without wings so he wouldn't fly away. Okay, go ahead and make sense out of that. I'd love to hear that. I can't figure it out. There were so many temples and idols and altars. No matter what God you worship, you could find him in Athens or a temple to him. But just in case, I mean, they'd gone down through their long list of idols and checked them all off. But just in case we missed one, Paul says, they found an altar to the God we don't know about. Paul was preaching in the marketplace. And as he, because apparently there wasn't much of a synagogue there, He's preaching in the marketplace where people, he had him a soapbox there, standing on the corner, preaching about Jesus, whoever would listen. But Athens was known for its study of philosophy, its search for knowledge and wisdom. And verse 21 says, the Athenians and strangers that are visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. They were hungry for anything new and different. So they said, Paul, we want you to speak to us. So they took him to the Areopagus, the third hill, Mars Hill. And standing on Mars Hill, right up here to your, behind you is the Acropolis, all these temples to all these gods. And so in verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus. There's a temple there to Mars, not Mars the planet, but Mars the god. Men of Athens, I observe you're very religious in all respects. Yeah, that's right, brother. Preach on, brother. Yes, sir. See all these temples, all these idols? I mean, they're everywhere. While I was passing through examining the object, your worship found an altar with this inscription, to the God you don't know. That's the God I want to tell you about. That's the God I've been preaching about. Now, if you'll read this sermon that Paul preaches on Mars Hill... He does not use Scripture because these people didn't know the Scripture. They were not the Jews who knew the Scripture. They were pagans who rejected the Scripture. 
This God that you worship is the God that made the world. In him we live and move and we exist. Even, by the way, one of your own poets said, we are the children of God. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember reading that. I learned that when I was in high school. They were saying, yes, sir, we understand all that. This God that you do not know, this God had a son, which to them was extremely strange, because in their pantheon of gods, their gods were men that died and were made gods. But this God had a son who became a man. Now that was new in their line of thinking. But this God overlooked your ignorance. In verse 30, he's now declaring that all people everywhere repent because he's fixed a day which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man that he has appointed. Furnishing proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard that, they said, wait a minute. This resurrection from the dead stuff is out of our ballpark. Some, and, and, and this is interesting, to every class, to every sermon, there are three responses. And we're going to fit into one of these three categories. Some began to sneer. They mocked. Don't believe. Others said, eh, we'll think about it. We'll hear you again. Come back tomorrow. Well, think about it. And others, verse 34, joined and believed. No matter what the lesson, no matter what the sermon, we're going to be one of these three. We're going to mock. We're going to think about it, come back, hear you again. And we're going to believe. Hope you're on the believing end. Trouble was, those who wanted to come back tomorrow... Paul was not there. He left, and he went down to Corinth. On down the coast, across the isthmus to Corinth. Corinth, too, was a very pagan city, a very idolatrous city. On their Acrocorinthus, their uh, Acropolis, there was a temple that housed a thousand priestesses. Now you can also spell that word priestesses as prostitutes. That's what they were. And to worship their gods, they would come down each day and they would engage the worshipers in prostitution. That's the background of Corinth. And Paul comes in preaching the gospel. So verse uh, eight, or chapter 18, verse 1. He left Athens, went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, the emperor, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So Paul came to Aquila and Priscilla. He was of the same trade, and he stayed with them, and they were working by trade. They were tent makers. Now, in, in Corinth, there are these little houses. They're, they're about maybe 12, 15 feet square, and, and they're two-story. The first floor, the first story is the, is the shop where they made and sold things. The upper story is where they, they lived. And that's common all over uh, the Roman world of the first century. So Paul was working with them, making tents. But verse, in verse 4, he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to persuade both Jews and Greeks. So he's working Sunday through Friday, and Saturday, the Sabbath day, he was preaching in the synagogues. Aquila and Priscilla were already Christians. They had just come from Rome. How'd they learn the gospel? Because on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, there were people there from Rome who took the gospel back home with them. And the church was already established in the city of Rome before the apostles got there, any of them. But verse 5, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. Wait a minute, what made the difference? Was, it, was he just waiting for Silas and Timothy to show up? Was he waiting for them to come and help him? Could he not preach and teach by himself? I mean, he did okay in Athens. 
And then you got to study First and Second Thessalonians and Philippians. Because when Silas and Timothy come down, Paul sends Timothy back to Thessalonica with First Thessalonians. While he's at Corinth, Timothy comes back and Paul sends him back up there with Second Thessalonians. And later Paul writes to the Philippians that on, from the very beginning they were supporting him. When Silas and Timothy came down to Corinth and met up with Paul, he did not have to continue making the tents because they brought money, support from the churches in Berea, Thessalonica, and Philippi to help Paul out in the ministry. So rather than working and teaching, working six days teaching one, he could teach all seven. And immediately he began teaching every day. Well, the Jews didn't like it, of course. They ran him out of the synagogue. He says, fine, verse 6, good. I'll just go to the Gentiles. You've rejected him. Well, we're supposed to bring the gospel to Jew first, then the Gentile. You've rejected I'll go to the Gentiles. And he went to a house of a man named Titius or Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Now Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, he believed, verse 8, and all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing, were being baptized. And then the, the Lord came to Paul in a vision and says, Do not be afraid. Now when he got to Philippi, he was afraid, beaten and jailed. When he got to Thessalonica, run out of town. Got to Berea, run out of town. Got to Athens, not much. Got to Corinth. God says, hang on. Don't worry about it. I got this. God says, I have many people in this city. Paul, I needed you to go to Philippi because of Lydia. I needed you to come to Corinth because I have many people in this city. In verse 11, he was there for a year and a half. And when Gallio was the governor, proconsul of Achaia, the Jews rose up against Paul. This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And Gallio says, I don't care. I am a Roman official. That is a Jewish problem. I don't care. And this I've never understood. They grabbed Sosthenes, who had taken the place of Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and they beat him in front of the judgment seat. And Galileo said, I don't care. The Jews were beating Sosthenes, or maybe the Gentiles were. By the way, the judgment seat there is, is a pretty cool place. I mean, there's this long area there kind of a wide road, some 20 feet wide, maybe wider. It's pretty long. There's shops on either side of it. Back over here is the Temple to Apollo. Way up here is the uh, Acro Corinthus. All the shops and marketplaces scattered around. And this judgment seat where Gallio sat, this road was used for slave races. Just to give you an idea of what was going on in Corinth, they take two slaves on your market, set, go. The winner became a slave. The loser was killed. You're kind of motivated to run, aren't you? They didn't care. Their concept of life and value of life was so bad or so low. The city was idolatrous, pagan, vile, but God had a lot of people in Corinth. Now, later Paul writes two or four letters, depending on how I understand it, to the Corinthians, to the church there. He's been there a year and a half working with the church. Later he writes these letters. And as you read those letters, you understand the background, what, going on, what was going on in Corinth. Some of what he wrote makes sense, as this city was like they were. So, after staying there a year and a half, Paul goes, takes leave of the brethren, and he says, I'm going to go home. And so he goes to the seaport, sails back, stop, makes a quick stop at Ephesus, and goes back to Jerusalem, and then back to Antioch. Pretty quick trip. 
took about three, maybe four years to make this journey. It took us, what, 30, 45 minutes to go through the, through the whole thing? It took Paul a lot longer to make that trip. Not just traveling time, but preaching time. But one point we never look at. Paul met the people where they were. He met Lydia at the river. He met the jailer in the jail. He met the people in the market. He met the Jews in the synagogue. He met the wise men on the hilltop. But wherever he was, he simply preached Jesus. Jesus Christ, dead, buried, and resurrected. He didn't bring them to church. He went to them. He didn't demand that they change their thinking. He just preached Jesus and let the knowledge of Jesus change their hearts. And God said, I got a lot of people that need to hear the gospel. And that's why Jesus said, go to all the world and make disciples. And that's why we want to be doing our best to live for him, to speak about him, and to serve in his name. And thus doing, we too can fulfill the Great Commission. May God bless you. Hope you have a great week. We're dismissed.